Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. We pray for peace on all His noble messengers, in particular the final messenger, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As we greet you all today from the south of England in the city of Portsmouth with Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum Alhamdulillah, today we are all very privileged and honored to have with us Sheikh Imran Hussain. Sheikh Imran Hussain specializes in Ilmul Akhru Zaman, which translates to in English as knowledge of the end times. Uh, in his early years, in his 20s, Sheikh graduated from the Anemia Institute of Islamic Studies and then completed a master's degree in philosophy from Karachi University. Later on, he also went on to the University of Geneva in Switzerland and completed a degree in um, international relations. Alhamdulillah, today's lecture will be about the the Jasad and Dabbatul Arq. Inshallah, we are expecting the lecture to take around one hour, and after the lecture, there will be time for a question and answer. And that question and answer will be strictly questions related to the topic only. And a final disclaimer that any views mentioned in this lecture are off the chefs. And I think now I've spoken enough, and I will hand over the microphone to Chef to begin the lecture. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Nahmaduhu wa Nusalli ala Rasulihil Kareem. We begin with Allah's blessed name, as the chairman also did. We praise Him and we glorify Him, as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all of His noble messengers and including the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. As we greet you, yes, with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Our topic is an interesting one, more than that. It's an exciting one. Exciting for those who recognize that absolute truth is located in the Quran, not with the British government, not with the newspapers and television. Absolute truth is located in the Quran. (coughs) Exciting for those who we want to go to the Qur'an to locate what the Qur'an has to say about the world today. Who does that today? Do you know of anyone who goes to the Qur'an to locate what the Qur'an has to offer which explains the world today? Nobody does that today. And yet, the Quran declares in Surah Al-Nahal that Allah has sent this book to explain all things. And therefore to explain the world, (laughs) the mysterious world today and the world which is yet to come. So good news and glad tidings for those in whose heart there is this thirst for knowledge and who in his whose heart there is this love for the book of Allah. Whether you be a brother or a sister it makes no difference. And you spend <laughs> your whole life devoted to the book of Allah. That the book of Allah and he who was sent to teach the Quran, namely Prophet Muhammad the book of Allah might teach you and explain to you the world in which we live today. I have been blessed by Allah to do this work for all my life. And I'm able to do it not only because of his kindness to me, but also because 
Allah blessed me with a great teacher who taught me how to study the Quran. And uh, we begin, <coughs> excuse the cough, it was heavy all through Ramadan. It's still there now, the cough. <coughs> Our Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, spoke about Dajjal that the Christians referred to as the Antichrist. And he called him al masih dajjal Dajjal, who will claim to be the Messiah, al masih dajjal but the Quran tells us that the Messiah is Jesus, the son of the Virgin Mary. He is the Messiah. So if this one claims to be the Messiah, obviously it is a false claim. And he is an imposter. So al masihud Dajjal is Dajjal the false messiah. Having explained that term, since it is his mission to impersonate the true messiah, what would he have to do? Uh, this will be the best introduction of all. I wrote it more than 20 years ago. Jerusalem in the Quran is the best introduction you will have for this subject. But uh, <coughs> I did write this book as well, my first book on Dajjal. Dajjal, the Quran and Awwal Zaman. Dajjal, the Quran and the beginning of history. And thank Allah, thank Allah, thank Allah. I was able to write this book, which is our subject of our lecture today, the Jal, the Jasad, and the Batullah. So, if he has to impersonate the Messiah and to deceive the Jews into believing that he is the true Messiah, rather than Jesus, the son of Mary, the Virgin Mary, Allah's blessing be upon him both, then what would he have to do? I cannot in this lecture take you back to the crucifixion. I, we don't have the time to do that. It's just sufficient that they rejected him as the Messiah. Jesus, the son of Mary, they rejected him. And when they saw him, Crucified, and I made it appear to them like that. They believed that he could not have been the Messiah, he is dead. And so they are still waiting for the Messiah. This is crucial information for you to be able to understand this subject. My students know the subject very well. <laughs> but those who are new and green, you got to Think. Be careful. You've got to first clean the mind. <laughs> he wants to impersonate the Messiah and deceive them into believing that he is indeed the true Messiah because they have rejected the true Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary. Now then, our Prophet said, Allah's blessing be upon him about the true Messiah. That he would rule the world with justice. Hakamun adlun wa imamun muqsitun. A ruler who will be just. Ruling what? Portsmouth? No. Ruling the world in the sense as having no rival to him. None who can threaten his rule over the world. And this is precisely the kind of rule that Solomon had. 
ne viso de mana de sala. It is in this sense of the word that Solomon ruled the world. Because there was no one on the earth who could rival his rule or threaten his rule. All had to submit to him. Today this is called Pax Suleimani. When you are a ruling state in the world and none can defy you, none can threaten you, none can rival you, then you are Pax Britannica or Pax American. And so. so this is what the Messiah will do. He will eventually rule the world. And he's coming back. This is not the topic for tonight. If the Messiah is to rule the world, he will have to do so from Jerusalem. He will have to establish a holy state of Israel in Jerusalem. That holy state of Israel must become a ruling state in the world. And then the Messiah can rule the world from Jerusalem. This is the easy part of the lecture. Now then, if the false Messiah is to successfully impersonate the true Messiah, obviously he will have to first of all liberate the Holy Land, which is under Muslim rule. Has he already done that? Has he already done that? Yes. I know many people eat the biryani and go home and sleep. <laughs> but there are others who are not sleeping. Yes. He's already done that. Liberate the Holy Land for the Jews. Number two, he has to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. Has he done that? Yes. Number three, he'll have to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land. Has he done that? Yes, he has. Number four, he has to cause that state of Israel to become the ruling state in the world. Is that about to occur? So now when when Israel becomes the ruling state in the world and after Pax Britannica has been replaced by Pax Americana and Pax Americana has been replaced by Pax Judaica only then would the Jal, the false Messiah, be able to stand up in Jerusalem and declare, I am the Messiah. Can you believe it? That this simple explanation, and I remain a solitary voice in the entire world of Islamic scholarship, for long is what? I'm the only voice saying this. Nobody is prepared to come forward and say exactly what I've just said. When this is so plain, <laughs> So I don't know what's wrong. Is it fear? Is it a lack of capacity to understand? Is it because they are imprisoned in a scholarship that cannot accept this? What it is, I don't know. But I still remain one solitary voice. Ever since I wrote Jerusalem in the Quran 20 something years ago to explain this subject, I still remain a solitary voice explaining what I have just explained to you. May Allah open the way for my students tomorrow, maybe one from Portsmouth, who will dazzle the world as a scholar of Islam. I mean, now, having established that the Dajjal wants to rule the world from the holy state of Israel, from Jerusalem in order to deceive the Jews and to declare that he is the Messiah. 
Let us now turn to the Quran and to Surah to Saad. I will not give you the number of the ayah, that's your homework. I just give you the name of the surah. And <coughs> Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam is the ruler of the world. The holy state of Israel based from Jerusalem is the ruling state in the world. No one can rival it, not even the queen of Sheba. All must submit to him. And then one day, Allah gave him what I recognize to be a vision. And he sees something with the internal eye. What does he see? You and I will immediately understand what happened because of the introduction I've already given you. But <laughs> the world of Islamic scholarship, all those who have written the tafsir of the Quran, every single tafsir you can find, still will not recognize what this verse, what this passage of the Quran is saying. But you will easily understand it. This is our predicament today. Ba'ana'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajeem Walaqad fatanna Sulaiman Allah says, and we tested him. We gave to him something which caused some distress to him. What was it? Wa'alqayna ala kursihi jasad and we placed a jasad on his throne. He is the king, he is the prophet, he is he who sits on the throne. But Allah puts someone else to sit on the throne. And that other person, Allah describes him as a jasad. So who or what is a jasad? Let the Qur'an answer that question. The Qur'an tells us that when Moses, Nabi Musa Islam, when he went up to the mountain, Mount Sinai, Allah called him there, he left the Banu Israel in Sinai. And one of them, known as the Samiri, told them, give me your gold. And he had a degree in engineering, metallurgy, so he melted, he melted the gold and he forged a golden cup. This man had a PhD in engineering. <laughs> and he, he forged the golden cup so skillfully that when the wind, when the wind blew, the cup would go Moo! <laughs> and Allah described that golden cap as a jasad, a body without a soul. And now the same word is used for someone sitting on the throne. This can't be a cap, this has to be a human being. Only a human being would sit on a throne. <laughs> so this is a human being but he does not have the soul that human beings have. That's why he's described as a jasad. When Suleiman alayhi salam saw him sitting on the throne in a vision, he immediately understood what was the meaning. He was able to interpret the vision. We would take years to interpret the vision. <laughs> yeah. Some of us never, but he, Suleiman, in the twinkling of an eye, is able to understand the vision. And we are able to recognize his understanding, 
his interpretation of the vision in the response that he made. This is proper methodology for study. What was his response? He turned towards Allah for Anna. And then he said to Allah, Rab, call Rab he wants to ask something from Allah. And his method is, if he wants to ask for something, he first asks for forgiveness. Setting an example for us, when we want to ask for something, first ask for forgiveness for sin that we have committed, all of us have committed sins. So, call the rugby fairly. He said, Oh Allah, kindly forgive me. He's not speaking about any particular sin that he committed. No. He's speaking generally to forgive me my sins. And grant that none can inherit my kingdom after me. You notice how slowly I'm speaking? <laughs> so it will sink in. He recognized that that fellow on the throne wants to inherit my kingdom. He recognized him as an evil being. And he does not want that evil being to ever wreck, inherit his kingdom. Who could that evil being be? Who wants to inherit his kingdom? And he is so opposed to it that he begs Allah that none should ever inherit my kingdom. Meaning, when I die, I want my kingdom to be finished so none can inherit it. You and I would easily recognize that that just that is the job. So then why is it <laughs> that why we can recognize so easily that just that is the job? How come that the world of Islamic scholarship. There's no one else who does that. Mind is still a solitary voice and they're not willing to accept my views. When it is so plain and clear. If he wants to inherit my kingdom and he is an evil being, Allah created an evil being, cool. What comes after? I seek refuge with Allah from evil which He has created. What is the evil that Allah has created? Only Bittajan. That's the only evil being He has created. So, <coughs> He does not want that evil being to inherit the kingdom. So he makes this dua. Grant me a kingdom which none can inherit after me. But it also has a second meaning. A grant that there will never be another kingdom that will ever be comparable to mine. Two meanings. From this passage of the Qur'an, we know this is the first reference in the Qur'an to Dajjal. First reference. There are others as well. But Dajjal is never mentioned by name. You have to have insight. You have to be able to interpret Ayat Mutashabihat. Verses of the Qur'an which must be interpreted to be able to recognize the verses in the Qur'an which pertain to Dajjal. But Allah not only answered the dua and caused the kingdom to collapse as soon as he died, 
but Allah did something else. He answered this dua by making this kingdom incomparable by putting something strange. In addition to human beings and angels, Allah has also created the jinn. And amongst the jinn, there are those who are Muslims, they are believers, and the others who are called Shayateen. There are lots of them in Washington. So, Allah gave orders to the Shayateen to work for Suleiman. And if they ever disobey him, Allah punishes them with terrible punishment. And the shayateen are involved in kulla banain bagamas, buildings, skyscrapers, tall buildings, huge things, and also going down into the depths of the earth. And when you go down into the depths of the earth, you can discover the diamond veins. You can discover gold. And more important than that, you can discover oil. Are you putting on your thinking capsule? These shayateen, Allah says, up and down. Up and down. So you're going to see, you're going to see in the future whoever has control over the Shayateen will be able to do wondrous things up above and below. Okay? And some of the Shayateen are also in chains and they're working for Suleiman. Now we leave Surah to Saad and the vision and the divine response and we go to Surah to Saba and it's time for Solomon to die. And once he dies, this dua is going to come into effect. And in Surah to Saba, Allah says, وَلَمَّا قَضَى Suleiman al -Mawt. When that time came for Solomon to die, the jinn did not know that he was dead. And they saw someone sitting on his throne. And whoever was sitting on his throne was impersonating Solomon. He was holding the staff of Solomon. And the staff of these two prophets were miraculous. The Prophet Moses, Musa Islam. Do you remember? He threw the staff on the ground and it became, remember? Became a serpent, a snake. Yeah, you remember? And uh, this uh, and he he took his staff and he struck the rock and twelve streams of water. But this staff of Suleiman salam, like the staff of Moses, Musa salam, has inside of it a miraculous capacity. And whoever is holding on to the staff is able to deceive the jinn 
by providing evidence. Yes, Solomon is still alive. Look at him, he's walking, he's talking, he's eating, he's sitting, he's standing. How can someone holding the staff do that? That inner capacity of the staff is described in Surat al-Saba as the min sa'a of the staff. When I was researching this subject a couple of years ago, I taught min sa'a. What is this? Because the staff is a saw and that is with sword. And minsa is with seed. So I consulted some of the best experts in Quranic um, semantics and the Quran of the Quran. And the, the Arabic of the Quran, people who had done their PhDs. And the answer that I got from them was that minsa is the same thing as asa. That minsa is just the stuff. And these are the best experts in the Arabic language and the Arabic of the Quran. But I was not happy with that. And so I forged ahead all on my own. And I eventually was led by Allah to understand that no, Minsa is not the staff. Minsa is the property of the staff, the capacity of the staff. That if you are holding on to the staff of Suleiman, alayhi salam, you can enter into time. And you can move forward and backward in time. Mm. Because Minsa comes from Nasi. In Naman Nasi um Ziyatun Lil Kufr is Surah to Toba. The system of time. And that was a great discovery. And so now, it was the Jaldi saw sitting on the throne. And because he was holding on to this stuff, he was able to bring movement of time backward and forward and show Suleiman still alive. Today, come and please on television, uh, General Charles de Gaulle is dead in the. But go on television, you see. <laughs> huh? uh, Ronald Reagan is dead in the. Go on television, you see him walking and talking. Today is common place. But at that time, the jinn were deceived. And they will continue to be saved. They will continue to be deceived. Says the Surah to Sava, until when? While the jar is sitting on that throne, and he has control over the shayati. He can order them to do everything he wants to do, cryptocurrency and all. And they will continue to obey him. Are you beginning to understand now the power of the modern West? This is what you're dealing with. And that has not as yet stopped. Because he is still sitting on the throne. Remember this is the vision, eh? This is the vision. He is still sitting on the throne. The jinn is still seeing him there. He is still giving them orders. And they are under an obligation to obey. And if they disobey, Allah will punish them. So they are on their way. But the Quran goes on to say that among the signs of, of the last stage of Akhirul Zaman, 
is not only the child, not only Gog and Magog, but also the battle of the beast or the creature of the earth. Christian eschatology has it, and we also have it. The battle of and the battle of this <laughs> is mentioned twice in the Quran. The first mention of Dabbatul Ard is that they would harm mankind. They would cause injury to mankind. Taklimo. And then the second reference to Dabbatul Ard in the Quran is here in Surah Al Saba. That it is when Dabbatul Ard comes. They are released and they start to attack the staff in order to consume the minsa of the staff. Only then will the staff lose its miraculous power. And the Jal will no longer have the shayateen working for him because now they would see Solomon is dead, so we can disobey him. <laughs> Allah will not punish us. When that happens, goodbye to the state of Israel. So then, who had the battle arm? Who will consume the means of the staff? I am full of sadness in my heart to have to disclose to you. It will pain you really when you read what are located in the books of Tafsir. Some of the most eminent of the scholars of Tafsir, including in the modern age, they say that, excuse me, excuse me, I should not be laughing. They say the Dambatul are the termites. And when Solomon died, no one knew he was dead. And the body was sitting on the throne, kept on sitting on the throne for I don't know how many years. No one knew he was dead. Until these termites came and started <laughs> nibbling at the bottom of the staff. And when the staff lost its balance, the staff collapsed and then the body collapsed. And only then did the world know that Solomon was dead. Go check it out. Go and check it out. You will find that this is what is to be found. This is the explanation that prevails in the world of Islamic scholarship. And when I offer this other explanation, which is truth, they resist me. I will be dead and still they will not accept it. What can you do? What can you do with such people other than what I am doing? I am teaching while still I have life and planting the seeds for a new generation of scholars of Islam who will emerge who will have the courage to extend the fringes of knowledge. And so that battle art has to be something which can damage and destroy the miraculous inner capacity of the staff. The miraculous inner power of the staff. What can it be that will destroy it? There are many young people who rush forward to say, no, it's 5G and 6G. 
the uh, electromagnetic ray, uh, wave that comes from the uh, wireless internet. I don't even know the technical terminology. But they rush out to say, yeah, this is it. And then when I examine that thesis, I find to my surprise, our Prophet said that birds flying in the sky, small birds will fall down. Small birds will fall down because they can no longer navigate because there is a contamination of the atmosphere. When bees can no longer navigate to go to the flowers for honey, and honey production is falling, you know you're dealing with this subject. But something else. Now the most important capacity that a human being has is his capacity to think. Is there anyone who will differ with that? And what is happening now is that our capacity to think is declining. One of the most important components of the process of thinking is memory. And if you look at the children today, a child at the age of 8 and 9 and 10 and 11 has the most powerful memory. That child can memorize the whole Quran at that age. You try to do the memorization of the Quran at age 40, see what's going to happen. But if you try to memorize the Quran at 7 and 8 and 9 and 10 and 11, you can do it. Because the memory of the child is so powerful. Guess what's happening in the world today for people who think? I'm not talking about those who eat the biryani and go home and sleep. I'm talking about people who think. The answer is children growing up in the cities are now suffering a decline in their memory. And so tomorrow you will never have any hafiz of the Quran from a child growing in the city. The hafiz of the Quran will be a child growing up in the village. Hmm? So there is evidence to support the view of those who rush to say, shake, 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 it's 5G and 6G. I say, yes, you are correct. That the Dabbatul Al that the Quran is speaking about is the electromagnetic waves with which we are now being inundated in the world, which is causing havoc not only to be to honey production, havoc not only to children whose memory is declining, but who knows what else is doing. And this is also destroying the minsa of the stem. I have taken you on an interesting journey today. I'm not boasting. Because when you boast Allah, it takes away your knowledge. But today I am unfortunately the only voice in the world of Islam which is explaining the subject this way. And my prayer is that Allah may send tomorrow scholars who will dazzle the world. In the meantime, here is this book, the Quran, the Jal, and the Jasad, which includes the Abbatul and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might bless you to penetrate absolute truth in the Qur'an 
So that the Quran might explain to you the world today. I want to stop now because I know the question and answer session is going to be exciting. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Jazakallah, Sheikh. Very much appreciate the lecture. Um, so I think we'll give it a few minutes for the question and answer, just for everyone to uh, think about any question they may, uh, they may have for the Sheikh. Okay, so I think for the question I'll say if anyone has a, uh, has a question for the chef, you just raise your hand and then you can go ahead and ask it. My hearing is declining. So when you ask the question, and he'll have to tell me what's the question. Go ahead. Yeah. Yep. It is the Shayateen who are assisting modern Western civilization with the continuing scientific and technological revolution, which is going up and going down. This is knowledge that Allah has given because He says in the Quran, was Allah has subjected to human beings, to the use of human beings, everything in the heavens and the earth. And they have the knowledge and they exploit it, so they gave us eye. Uh, maybe in another lecture you will hear me speaking on the subject of Tajal and oil, not today. And yes, we are entitled to that knowledge because it's the property of all of mankind. So that does not mean that technology is something haram. What is haram is the use of the technology. If you use the technology, like I use a laptop, and I've written, mashallah, about 31, uh, 31 books and I'm now working on number 32. If I didn't have the laptop, I would not be able to do so much work. So I am using technology, but I'm not using it in a haram way. But cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, huh? that also is technology at work in the world of money. But you'll never find me buying cryptocurrency and buying Bitcoin. You'll never find me doing that. Not at all. And if I had support from the world of scholars of Islam, we would have been able to build our markets with gold and silver coin, dinar and dirham. And we would not be using this paper money, which is a rope around our neck. They've used the paper money to bring down Imran Khan in Pakistan with inflation. It's the deadliest weapon of all because they can change the value of money. It's a very simple thing to study. So when we find something in the world of science and technology from which we can benefit, we should benefit from it. So any next questions? Yep. So you mentioned the Shaitans of the Sulaim al Islam, obviously they were aware of the Shaitans, they were afraid of the 
of making sure they must want to be of love. So, in the modern day context, other charities, where they are charities, why are they fears for paying the world of their money? So, it's the question what are the fears of the charity and where are they? The modern day charities, what, are they aware they are charities? Are they aware? And then, second of all, if they are aware, why are they paying the world of their money? Mm. So the question is, Chef, are modern day shayateens aware they are uh, shayateen? And if they are aware, um, like why are they doing what they are doing? Is the question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> modern day shayateen are to be found everywhere. But they. They don't know that they are charity. They just brought down Imran Khan's government in Pakistan. <laughs> yes, but they don't know. Okay. They believe the chief of staff of the Pakistan Armed Forces believes he is rightly guided. He doesn't even have a passing acquaintance with the Quran. They don't teach that in the military academies, but no one is allowed to differ with him. Then die. No one is allowed to uh, question him. You have to accept whatever the armed forces say, submit to us. <laughs> you see, this is the profile of the shayateen around the world today. You also have shayateen amongst Women, our prophet said, the last people to follow women, follow the jar, will be women. And a man would have to return to his home and tie down, meaning coercively restrain his wife, his sister, his daughter, to protect them from being seduced and brainwashed by the jar. And the world of women today is being constantly increasing. The brainwashing is constantly increasing. And so for to find a righteous woman today who submits to truth in the Quran, mashallah for her, mashallah for her, mashallah for her. This will make you a good wife. Allah says, for example, He says, if you have dispute between husband and wife, if there is a divorce, for example, He says, get hakaman min ahlihi wa hakaman min ahliha. Someone from his family and someone from her family to sit down together to try to mediate because you don't want this private matters to be brought into the public. Look at the beauty and the sense and wisdom. Hakaman min ahlihi wa hakaman min ahliha. Someone from his family and someone from her family will sit down and listen to both sides. Guess what's happening today? <laughs> from the time a divorce is to take place or threatened, Everything is put out into the public to try to destroy the other party. If this is not sinful, go back to school. This is a violation of Allah's command in the Quran. This is sinfulness. And then the matter goes to court and he cannot see his own children. Sometimes one year, sometimes two years. She takes those children and holds them as hostages against him. Hmm? This is part and parcel of the tremendous work of the shayateen on our sisters today. So may Allah bless the righteous woman of Islam who will not follow and fall victims of the shayateen. They are everywhere today, as I told you, most of all in Washington. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Uh, next question. So I actually had a question.
question, Sheikh. Yeah. So we had told them that the jaw will have one eye and they will have calf written on his forehead. So I think for a lot of people here, that's probably what they have been taught. So could we know if that's meant to be interpreted or if it's as it is? I spent the whole month of Ramadan producing a video for every day of Ramadan. I don't know if Osman was aware of that. No? Nobody. <laughs> every day of Ramadan I produce a small video, sometimes 10, sometimes 15 minutes long. And in these videos I taught this subject about the job. That uh, our prophet said, every prophet has warned his people about the job. And the Prophet knew, knew warned his people about the job. But I am going to tell you something no one has ever said before me. That the Jal sees with one eye, his left eye. He's blind in the right eye. It looks like a bulging grip. But your Lord is not one eye. Between his eyes on his forehead is written the word kafir, disbeliever. And every mu'min, someone who has faith in his heart, would be able to read the word kafir on his forehead, whether that mu'min or that believer is katib, or literate or illiterate. You can still read. So, Ali radiallahu ta'ala, and who could read it? And he could read Kafir on his part. But why is it that Abu Jahal cannot read? So we send Abu Jahal to the eye specialist. He's called the ophthalmologist for an inspection of his eyes. And the report comes back, his eyesight is perfect. But is this right? If Abu Jahal's eyesight is perfect, why can't he read? But Ali can read. Is it that Ali is not reading with these eyes? Do we have, do we have any other eye beside these eyes? This is a branch of knowledge called epistemology. So we are talking about external sight. We're talking about, yes, we have an internal eye and we can see with internal sight. And so the reason why Ali could read is because he's reading not only with his external eye but also with his internal sight. And the reason why Abu Jahl cannot read is because he is internally blind. This is our interpretation of the Hadith. And so the Jal has external vision. The one with which you can pursue the scientific and technological revolution. And scale the skies. But the Jal is internally blind. And all those who are embraced by the child will be also internally blind. And any time he plays a tune, they will dance to his Peter part. I don't know how many charity could stand in between and fill that space. It is because they were internally blind that in this country, Britain, there were so many who danced with Dajjal and stood up for Salah, 
three feet apart. They look like monkeys to me. But Allah also said, <coughs> follow the Prophet. And our Prophet gave us what are the rules for Salah. And he said, don't change this, don't make bidah. Don't make bidah. If you make bidah and you change the religion, no water for you on Judgment Day from Kausa. And guess what they did? If you want to perform Salah, you must have a face mask. No mask, no entry. Is this a part of what the religion the Prophet Muhammad gave us? No. If someone wants to wear a face mask, they're up to him. He want, he's a man and you want to be in Nikah, fine. <laughs> but, but you cannot make it obligatory. If you make it obligatory, you're changing the religion. Allah is Akbar in his house, not the government. Allah is Akbar in his house, not the government. I have never ever performed Salat with a face mask. I have never participated in Salat with people standing three feet apart except once in France I was caught by surprise and I was already in the masjid. Other than that I never performed Salat because it's a bogus Salat. It's a bogus Salat. And so in the Jal stands up in Jerusalem and he declares, I am the Messiah. You and I would easily recognize this is the job. But guess what? The sheep and the cattle who do not have internal sight, they will say, no, 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 he cannot be the job. Why? Because he's seeing with two eyes. And our prophet said that the Dajjal sees with only one eye. So he can't be the Dajjal. The sheep and the cattle will not be able to understand this hadith and interpret it correctly. Next question, everyone. Go to the front here. I was just thinking, just a random point. Um, we know that Iblis is our sworn enemy, that he's here to take us to hell. And I was just thinking, when the judge comes, how is the relationship with the other? Are like team up, or who's the boss, who's going to control the food, and so on? So the question is um, so when the judge does come back, will the judge and Iblis work as a team, or like he wants to know who was the boss? Who is the boss? Who is the boss? Like, is it? The, the Jajal has control over the Shayateen. They are ordered to work for him. Shaitan is the boss of the Shayateen. So he is in control. The Jajal, not Iblis. And Iblis and his Shayateen will have to work. For the job. Thank you very much, Shaykh. Mm. Next question. Mm. Just wanted to clarify mm. the Shaykh, I think, uh, uh, regarding Riba, majority of the Muslim community in the UK believe that it's uh, okay to buy one house in Riba because we have to deal with this country. I just want to ask Shaykh if there's any evidence of that that we can do that in living in the West to buy yeah. one house. So the question is, um, so here in the West, people buy one house with riba and they say it's like acceptable because you need to live. So I uh, wanted to know whether there was any like evidence from the Quran or Sunnah that's allowed or whether that's completely forbidden and what best solution we should do. You have to be very, very foolish to make halal what Allah made haram. You have to be reckless to make full, make halal what Allah made haram. Those who have given this bogus fatwa, 
that because you come to the West and that's the only way you can get a house, those who are given this bogus fatwa, I pity them on Judgment Day. I pity them on Judgment Day. Because what Allah has made haram, you cannot make halal. Yes, there are abnormal situations where the law is suspended temporarily. Like there is no food and people are starving. And the only food available is lahmul khinzir, pork. And Allah says in the Quran, you can eat the pork. But that is only a temporary state. Because while you are eating the pork, you will eat the minimum. Okay? Number two. You would lick your fingers <laughs> enjoying the pork. Number three, while you're eating the pork, you're constantly looking for food so you can stop eating the pork. How then do we explain? You use this to go and buy your big house. You fill your plate with pork. My gosh, look at how it's loaded. It's not a one bedroom house, eh? Number two, you are licking your fingers, you're enjoying, you're proud of the fact you have this house. You're boasting to others. Number three, you sign an agreement for 30 years of pop. When you suppose to eat the pork for the minimum time possible until you can get food. So don't use this analogy to justify your monstrous betrayal. You didn't have the knowledge because your scholars failed you. They didn't teach you the subject and you went in and you signed the agreement. And now you have a rope around your neck. Don't blame me for that. Blame yourself. What to do now? You do what countless of my students have done when they realize what sin they are entered into. They got rid of the house as soon as they could. Regardless of what the price they had to pay. And then they rented I lived in the United I lived in the United States for twelve years. And for twelve years I was paying a rent. I never ever thought about buying a house. You rent a place. And when you cannot afford to rent a place, you make hitra. You go somewhere else where you can afford to live. That is my answer to you, it is haram. And no one can make Haram, you cannot make it halal. Jazakallah, Mary Sheikh. Next question. Hi. What do you make, Mr. Mary Sheikh? So, I uh, mentioned the uh, given analogy about maybe the poor, but in extreme circumstances for uh, a short period of time. Uh, earlier, you mentioned about uh, wearing masks in the, in the very right situation. It was obviously poor feedback when someone's supposed to. How is that? So the question is, um, so you mentioned earlier about wearing a mask, being a bidder, and then mentioning pork when you're in like a severe situation that it's okay to eat. So is it the link between the two? Yes. The I never said that wearing a mask was bidder. I said those who want to wear the mask will have the freedom to do so. I have no problem with that. I said when you impose it as the law, you're not allowed to enter the house of Allah. 
You're not allowed to stand in the soft of joy in the salah unless you have a mask. That is big up. Let me share with you my disappointment. <laughs> Very Portsmouth. I came to you to teach you a subject no one else can teach you. I'm the only one who can teach you. This is so important a subject to understand what is happening in the world today. And now am I being asked to answer about birthdays? No, I'm not going to answer that question. I'm going to tell you I'm disappointed because I expected from Portsmouth that you will pay some attention to a tremendously important subject. And your question will be directed towards this. Secondly, I have women attached to me who are so intelligent, who have such insight that I, I benefit from them. That's the woman attached to me. And our sisters are just silent, silent today. I'm disappointed, yes, really. So I'm not going to answer that question. Uh, next question. I think we had a question. Two questions. Ah, yes. Oh, good. We now have a question from our elder sister. Maybe this is a bit unrelated, but I want to know what you think of Putin. A bit of our topic, but what do you think about Putin? The subject is connected with the job. Putin is connected with the subject of Dajjal, connected with the subject of Akhir zaman In this sense, that Allah speaks of a time in the Quran when the Jews will be the most hostile of all people to us Muslims. And Allah says, at that time, there will be a Christian people will be closest in love and affection for the Muslims. Who are those Christians? The chief of staff of the Pakistan Armed Forces is blissfully ignorant of this. The president of Turkey is even more blissfully ignorant of it. We are led by people who have less than a passing acquaintance with the Quran. That's our pathetic state today. And you're not allowed to say this. <laughs> The Christian people who will be closest in love and affection for us Muslims in Akhir zaman would not be the Christians of the West where a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate. No. It would be those Christians who belong to Eastern Orthodox Christianity. And already you are seeing them drawing closer to us. Because the Ottoman Empire waged war on Russia for so many centuries, there was tremendous hatred in Russia against Islam. The Russian people, the Russian Orthodox Church would not allow the Muslims to build masjid. In Moscow, even though you have about two million Muslims in Moscow. 
And guess what Putin did? He overruled the Orthodox Christian Church in Moscow. And he ordered the construction of the biggest masjid in the whole of Europe, in Moscow. I don't need to go further to provide you with evidence. These are the Christians that Allah is speaking of, who will be closest in love and affection for Muslims. And look at Ukraine. Look at Ukraine. Those who are fighting with the greatest courage and valor in Ukraine are Muslims. Chechen Muslims are fighting heroic, heroic struggle in Ukraine. And all of Russia is seeing how the Muslims are fighting in support of Russia in Ukraine. So the critics can bite their fingers in frustration. It makes no difference. The reality on the ground is an alliance between Mus Muslims and Orthodox Christians is on the way. And I left my home in Trinidad, left my wife in Trinidad, who is longing for me to be there, and traveled to Britain. And I'm now going from Britain to Netherlands. More than five weeks of lecturing here and then two weeks of working there. So I'll be a tired man when I reach to Armenia. Why am I going to Armenia? I'm going to Armenia because Azerbaijan is seeking to fan the flames of war between Muslims and Orthodox Christians. Not the Azerbaijani people, but the Zionist rulers of, Afghani, of Azerbaijan. So I'm going to Armenia to tell them what the Quran says about Christians. This is my first visit to Armenia. And wherever I have gone in the Orthodox Christian world and I have presented the Quran to them, they have always responded positively. Several of them are now saying, we accept the Qur'an to be the word of the one God. Read my book, which is there at the back, my last book. The Messiah, the Qur'an, and Akhir Zaman. This is my last book. And see the forward of that book, written by an Orthodox Christian scholar. He's a Christian. He says, I believe that the Quran is the word of God. I believe that Muhammad is the greatest of all the prophets of God, but he's still a Christian. And I don't stand up on a table with a dandan man. Take the shot, take the shot. I don't do that. That's not wisdom. <laughs> that man is my dear brother and friend. And so we see, I'm from Armenia, I want to go to Russia, but I don't think I'll get a visa. But I'm also going to, to Greece, I'm going to Macedonia. Why am I traveling to all these places in my old age? I'm trying to build fraternity between these two ummahs. The ummah of Muhammad and the ummah of Nabi Isa Islam. And Alhamdulillah, I thank Allah, He is blessing my effort with success. This is my answer about Putin. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Sheikh. I think we have a question here as well. Um, yeah, Sheikh's partly answered the question that I have because of this, this discussion. But my thing was, um, going back to what the brother pointed out about buying a house, and that it's halal just because it's a one property. I, you know, many years ago I sort of suggested that, but when I looked at it, at the bigger picture, if we're all buying one, we're all feeding into the system together to feed this sort of lease. And so, you know, I, I sort of went, no, that's not what I, what I want to do. But in terms of doing, what is it called, the, the hijra? Yeah. What, um, what does the chef suggest, like, in the history of living amongst, I mean, like I said, it's partly answered the question, living with all Orthodox Christians and Muslims together? Uh, so the question, first of all, was about comment about riba, and then the second part was the main question about, was it making hijra and living yeah. with Orthodox Christians? Uh, what would your advice be to people who are thinking about Hijra and living with Orthodox Christians? Muslims in this age 
should be following the advice of the Prophet who said, the time will come when the best property of a believer will be sheep and goats that he takes with him to the mountain sides. Pakistan has lovely mountains. Albania has lovely mountains. Take with him to the mountain sides and to places where rain falls, fleeing with his religion. When you go to the mountain side, when you make Hitra, you should also try to bring with you and build with you fraternity with other people who live the religious way of life. You find a Hindu, and that Hindu is righteous, a righteous person. You can live with him as a neighbor, a Christian, a Jew, whoever is righteous and is not hostile to your faith. It is better than only Muslims living by themselves because then you are an easier target. Uh, next question, Lego. A question back here. Is the virus part of the Minsa? So the question is, is the virus a part of the Minsa? Okay, I came to the conclusion two years ago that this virus has not come from nature. Rather that this virus represents biological warfare. Biological warfare. And I recognize the footprints of Dajjal. And the footprints of Dajjal, I, I don't have the time to expand on this now, always comes in three parts. I don't have the time to explain. Uh, but uh, this book, uh, Jerusalem in the Quran, will give you the three parts. So we've had one part of the virus so far, and there's a second to come, and then there's a third. This is my eschatological view. This one was a light shower of rain. But when the second one comes, it will be heavy rain. And when the third one comes, it will be thunder showers. So their plan is biological warfare that will wipe out large numbers of people. But our Prophet, Allah blessing be upon him, prophesied. He said the Arabs will be attacked by plague. And they will die the way sheep die in a plague. So I, reading between the lines, that this biological warfare is meant to culminate with the Arabs being wiped out in Israel and around Israel. I don't know when the second stage will start, but I was able to travel from Trinidad to London and no virus restriction. None. All they asked for was my passport. So it seems to me as though phase one is coming to an end. And there's a lull before phase two starts. I was happy when confirmation came in the Security Council of the United Nations. When Russia presented in the United Nations Security Council evidence that the Western world were funding laboratories in Ukraine where birds and bats were being infected with the virus and they were there were, there were numbers attached to their legs. And these metallic numbers could be activated from a satellite above. And they would study the migratory pattern of the birds, where they would fly. 
And when a bird was over a target territory, that bird would then be brought down through a satellite. And then the virus would spread in that territory. Russia presented the evidence in the Security Council of the United Nations. Evidence which confirmed that this was biological warfare. Next question. Question question is, if Muslims were to migrate from the West, which countries would you recommend? Go back to the land from where your parents came. And if you are from British ancestors, then remember that Muhammad was from Mecca, and he left Mecca. So if you have to leave Britain, you will be following the Sunnah. If you are from Pakistan, go back to Pakistan. I would love to go back and live in Pakistan myself, but I don't think the Pakistan Armed Forces will allow me to do that. Because I'm hitting them very hard now, okay? The normal Pakistani can't do it. It would be too dangerous for him. But I can do it and I'll continue to do it. So I probably won't be allowed to enter Pakistan. But if you can return to Pakistan, many of my students in Britain have already done that. And they're building, they're building communities now in the mountains of Pakistan. Many of my students. And the mountains of Pakistan are so beautiful, you can't believe it. Why would you leave that to come and live here? Hmm? Azad Kashmir is so beautiful. The greenery. If you are from Egypt, go back to Egypt. If you're from Algeria, go back to Algeria. And if you're from Bangladesh, go back to Bangladesh. I, I went twice to Bangladesh. I went only to the south, not to the north. I went down to Teknaf. The only thing you have to be scared about in Bangladesh is the way they drive on the roads. <laughs> the way they drive on the roads, yeah. I had a vehicle and we were driving to Chittagong and he knocked down a bicycle and he never stopped. He never stopped. <laughs> but the Bangladesh, the people of Bangladesh were so kind, so loving, so hospitable. It was a joy to be with them. So why don't you go back to Bangladesh? Yeah, just to clarify, um, because of the Bangladesh, if you look at Islamic life, it's very, very down at the moment. It's, there's, about six, there's a lot of people in there, but the country is Muslim, but there's no practice of Islam. It's declined so much so that you can say it was like a, a Kufu state. People who say out of the state of Britain can go back to Bangladesh. Because here, you can practice Islam more better than going into Bangladesh or some other Muslim countries. So my question to you, what are the other countries? Could be Malaysia or any other country, the Muslim can migrate from the West and also have a facility to educate the children into manners that we have Islamic living daily basis, practicing, and this stuff. Anyone can go back to the country, but the country that we left, it is a reason because you cannot practice Islam freely, you'll be suppressed, no education system will support you. So we're looking for a country actually who supports and welcome Muslims can live and practice the religion daily basis. I'm not talking about mountains. I can go to mountains, but how am I going to get to schools with my children to educate them? Okay, the what, I ask, what I ask you to do is I have a little book at the back. The Quran, <laughs> the Great War, and the West. Read that book and see what the Quran is saying of the faith which awaits the Western world, including Britain.